So yeah, hi everyone. Another episode for Access to Perspectives Conversations. Today we have Dana Williams, um, who's a who's a business owner and helps leaders and teams and businesses and, and companies to upgrade their lives, um, embracing the their strengths and yeah, basically um having them through a life transformation and yeah welcome to the show Dana it's Thank great you, having you Joe I'm so excited to be here today with you and to talk to your followers and it's such a great time and here I am in Dallas Texas and you're in Germany it's like dinner yeah. time there right and oh. it's in the morning here so I might be a little peppy <laughs> <laughs> I know it's the end of the day for you so um hopefully yeah, I can it's... boost the end of your day for you no, yeah, no, it's it's it will be a beautiful close of the day. It's five thirty now or approaching, so it's not too late. And yeah, let's have this conversation. Um, so as you know, like the most of the listeners come from an academic background, maybe not all. I don't know, like who else is, might be listening. But the idea with conversations like this is like is mostly about science related stuff and science management, research management, open science, which is basically also transforming the research ecosystem and um, the publishing industry, the yeah the academia as a whole. Mm-hmm. To, towards enabling science to better serve society um also with the high throughput um yeah research results that are coming and with the challenges we're facing but um so um we like this shows also to yeah to equip researchers and academic staff with all the tools and techniques they might need and appreciate to do the best possible work and also have a uh, work life balance and have fun and and enjoy work as much as their personal life because we spend most of our time at work um for me it's and for me it's in the home office with my own business but um i might also eventually have an actual office space i don't know like with the dogs it's it's a it's an extra consideration to have but um we still need some sort of work life balance and and I'm I'm questioning myself, maybe this can also I don't know if we can start with this before going into why how you came about to to work as a coach and consultant. Um is there even is it even possible to differentiate between work and life? Because we're still one human being and and like is it even possible to leave work at work and and personal stuff at home? And to what extent should either space make room for the other yeah I mean, that's a big question to start that's with a big question <laughs> but i would start with um right now we've got five generations in the workplace so it depends on where they've come oh it, okay it, i haven't even thought about that that's a whole new yeah whole new thing right so because everybody's gonna you know generation um z is gonna be you know different from generation x from millennials from baby boomers, and they're all going to come at it different. Mm. So I'm a baby boomer, right? So I came at work with, you know, the generation before me, my parents' generation work hard. You're not working hard unless you're there, you know, eight to five and you're pouring in and then you have your family time after that. And Mm. then came along, you know, Gen Z and then, and then the millennials and the millennials are like, oh, life is a buffet. You know, where where am I going to eat from on this table? And I, it all blends. Mm. And then, and then the the next generation generation z is like you know oh my life has to be meaningful Mm. and if i'm not doing meaningful work then it doesn't mean anything Mm. so i think depending on where you come from and which of those generations you're in is how you're viewing life and how you role model life but what happened with the pandemic is that we got to have a whole workplace reshift Mm. with working, working from home. And all of a sudden people were trying to manage if they were a millennial or, or younger, and they're trying to manage their home life with their kids. And, and then boomers are like, I don't know how to work at home because I've always worked at the office Mm. and, and, you know, all of that going on. And so there's this work shift. And so now we're at this place where the pandemic is the pandemic we're going through now is mental health. And 
So when you say, you know, is it, you know, how do you manage both? I think it's you knowing what you need best for you based on who you are and what you need. For me, it was transforming from managing my life around my work. Now I manage my, my work around my life. Does that make oh, sense? Yeah, totally. Because yeah. So I made the transformation as yeah. a boomer. Yeah, I was like, no. I had this, there's a saying I don't know who says this but there's a there's a saying that northern and central Europeans live to work where the, whereas southern Europeans tend to work to live yeah. that's basically your, the transformation that you're going through and I I just came from Greece which is a, mm -hmm. at the Mediterranean and I spoke to a friend who who lives there and also mentioning that and then I figured maybe it's because particularly in Germany but first of all in the north we have have like like is it severe what's the word like um like we have stronger seasons or the seasons mm -hmm. are heavier but how would you say this in English well you know like, like with with weather is that what colder, you're yeah like so yeah. we have cooler winters we have snow yeah. like, no way to... mild versus up. right now we're having it in 90 degrees here in dallas this week which is us unusual we're usually in the 40s 50s mm. and then right above us in the united states so across from seattle oregon all the way over to um, the east coast it's blizzard mm. so we're having these opposite situations going on in the united states right now kind of like what you're talking about so they're having you know blizzard-like conditions and we're having unusual heat yeah um, in two different parts of the country yeah same like in here it's across the continent which is still a tiny place i think like mm -hmm. the whole of europe would fit mm -hmm. easily fit into the, the united states um but yeah so so it might also be because germany might be a um, particular case because we literally had to rebuild the country from ashes and mm -hmm. i think this mentality is still there like you have to work to survive I can really work hard and there's no no like no excuse. And yeah, so we take work really seriously, whereas other cultures, also further north, are more appreciative of enjoying life and you know, just cutting a slice also at work and um taking coffee breaks and enjoying these and and cult like cultivating also breaks. For the opportunity of having an informal work meeting but not taking it too seriously so there might also be some blending between work uh, personal and work related um discussion topics and then also like there's also a question about like why do you choose a particular job or career is it like that you want to that it's purpose driven or passion driven. You want to um, have an impact on society, hopefully positively so. <laughs> um, and like at least with your intentions to start with. And for others, it's just to sustain, like to to you know to have an income to build a family and to to make a living, like an actual personal living, and to build prestige and buy a fancy car. And for that, you need a job that pays well, and that might. I mean, it's or to have a sense of security and maybe also a little bit of luxury on top of that. And some need more and others need less thereof. But so there's also, I think, different personality types. And you see the whole spectrum also inside academia, whereas traditionally, I would argue, academics or researchers choose their research career out of passion and or curiosity. So when I ask PhD students in their early year, like in the first or second year, why they choose the research career, which is usually not so well paid. Mm -hmm. And when they have friends in, who who go into the corporate world after school, they they make like like several times the salaries. I don't know. And they, you know, it takes them two or three years until they can buy their own apartment or build a house mm -hmm. and and academics would yeah are in different monetary situations but they happily embrace it because of academic freedom mm -hmm. because they're so passionate about what their research is all about but then in bioscience it has become quite an industry and a high throughput and high 
um, highly challenging um, and full of pressures to publish um, work environment. So it's more of a job for many, or they might start with a purpose and a passion for the topic, but then find themselves in, in an industry-like setting. Um, so yeah, so where I'm going with this is how, so, and you mostly work with corporate people and companies and also individuals who mostly work in the corporate world. And if we could hear from you, first of all, how you got into that, um, how, how did you choose your career? What brought you there to to support the workforce and and the the environment, like as in the leadership and the team team settings, and and then like your focus is strengths building or identifying strengths in a team and in a leader, and what does it do? Like and also what transitions and transformations can you have them pursue? Absolutely. Well, there's a lot of questions in there, so I might talk for a oh. little bit if that's okay. <laughs> yes, please. So, yeah. So I started my career in the airline industry oh. and I actually started out in operations at a company in, in the United States called Southwest Airlines and a little small carrier at the time. And I started in in-flight and then I loved, I really didn't, I, that was the operations piece, but I knew I wanted to get management. So at 21, I got promoted to manager. And then that was my first experience in really managing. I had like 150 flight attendants I had to manage and managing all the things that go with that, the hiring, the training, everything that went with flight attendants. And I love the hiring. And I think it was a psychology of interviewing people, getting to know people. And so by 23, I was like, man, I love this. So I got in the HR department. And at that time, there was only three of us. It was the vice president and the director and me. And we did all the hiring from pilots to mechanics to um, executives. And it just catapulted me into really being curious about people and what and helping getting the right people placed in the right position. Mm -hmm. And as the company grew, my husband and I at the time ended up moving to Nashville, Tennessee. And so I had to leave the company and I always had another desire, which was marketing. I said, well, I've done operations, I've done HR, I think it's time to learn marketing. So I went um, and worked for a real estate development company, which was kind of just happened, became the marketing director and really cut my teeth on marketing and opened the first downtown mall in Nashville in a long time, which is now the country music museum there. Um, but anyway, fun time, learned a lot, moved back to Dallas, Texas. And went back to Southwest Airlines and went into the marketing department at this point. The company was now about 20 years old. I started with them when they were 10 years old. At this point, they were 20 years old. And we were acquiring an airline. We were um, kicking off new opportunities to open new cities. And so I learned a lot about marketing and how to open a new city and how to study. We did a lot of research that so we had to study, you know, what are the people in the city, what do they need? What do they think about the brand? How do we build our messaging based on that brand? And then I did that. And then I decided I really wanted to give back to my community, be available for my daughter. So I took about nine years off of that, started a Christian high school with my husband and some other couples, worked for a nonprofit and did all their branding. Um, it was a hospice organization. So kind of used that meaningful work at that point. And then Southwest called again in 2009, right after the recession. I think I was the only hire that year in marketing and had to end up really transforming the department because we didn't want to lay people off and we didn't want to let them go, but we had to put people in efficient areas. Mm -hmm. And so that was my HR hat came back on at that mm -hmm. point as a marketing leader. And, um, so I've kind of got this what's called a talent stack of HR, operations, marketing, and, and then this whole passion that came about in 2012 when I was working as a leader in marketing and I was trying to find a tool we could use to help leaders and employees be engaged, help them feel engaged every day at work. Because 
the time it was taken to hire, train, and bring, at this point, we had just acquired another airline. So this was my second acquisition that I worked on. And I was like, how do we make sure we're getting the right people in the right places, but also that they're engaged every day. Mm. And so one of my girlfriends bought this tool in. At the time, it was called Strength Finder. Oh, yeah. And, I heard about that one. Uh-huh. And then um, it changed the name to Clifton Strengths in the last five years. So we took the assessment and went, whoa, this is really good. Uh And you guys, you and your audience would appreciate this because StrengthsFinder was developed by Dr. Clifton in the 60s. Uh He said, what if we study what's right with people instead of what's wrong with them? Uh And my whole life, and you would probably think about this too, Joe. If somebody said, write a list, get a piece of yellow paper out, write a line down the middle, write down on the left everything you're good at, right on the right, everything that you need improvement on, which side is going to be longer in your, if you do that list right now. So if I do it for myself, probably the downside is longer yourself. because self-criticism naturally. Yeah. But why is it natural to self-criticize? It is yeah. so natural, right? We have 6,000 thoughts a day. 90% of those are negative. Why? So why are we spending time on things that aren't really true? Hmm. So his philosophy was they were trying to fix somebody as psychologists. They were trying to fix, well, how can we help them be better and manage their weakness? He said, wait a minute. He was a statistician, mathematician. He was also a psychologist. Mm -hmm. What if we study what's right and help them do more of that? So he created the assessment in the 60s. And it was a development assessment. And they would use it for corporations to help people develop their leaders, right? And they would do the interviewing over the phone because back then nothing was online. Mm -hmm. And then it went online in 1990s. At that same time, he bought the Gallup company, which is a huge research company here in the United States. And Gallup's known for political research, right? But Gallup is the the kind of owner of the Clifton Strengths tool and the Clifton family runs Gallup. Mm -hmm. So when I came across this tool and started using it, it was a light bulb moment for me because I learned strengths that I didn't even know I had. I learned that I was one in 34 million with the talents that I have in the order they're in. There's not anybody else going to have those same talents as me in that order. And this is all based on the data from Gallup from over, you know, four decades of research. So we were getting ready to do a um, kind of a employee in our, in our department, we were getting ready to do a reorg and we decided to use on our top leaders, have them take the assessment and then help place them in areas after our reorg based on their talent. And so because I had high strategy, I got put in this like strategic placement, strategic um, advisor role Hmm. and it was just like every day I felt like I was just in flow because I was doing exactly what I love doing um and so when you're living in your strengths you are energized and my mission is to help people birth their purpose and live in their strengths daily and Hmm. I think so many people in the workplace right now are frustrated and upset or because they don't know what their talents are. There's a lot of assessments out there and there's nothing wrong with any of them. I just think that Clifton Strengths really helps you identify the strengths. And once you start practicing them every day, you go, oh God, okay, this is, this is good. Mm. And it makes you energy. So I have a saying that it's not about managing your time. It's about managing your energy. And so that's what I, so we started doing it in 2012. The company wasn't ready for it yet, but they said, you can do it in your department. So we implemented it with our leaders and with all employees, with new employees onboarding. And before we knew it, all the other departments were saying, how did y'all do this? What can we do? Can you help us? So we were helping the other departments before HR said they would take it company-wide. It wasn't until our president said, I want to be a strength-based organization Mm. that we became strength-based. So now every leader that gets hired, every department, we hired coaches. I worked on the coach. I worked on the whole strategy of that and the coach, coach development program. And so then I decided it's time to go out on my own. I don't know when that's going to be, but this is what I'm going to do. I loved the coaching. I loved working with the other teams and I saw the power 
that happened when people lit up because they recognized their value. Yeah, I can imagine even if a person goes through the processes and ends up not being hired, it's still a win for them for having done the assessment, like assessing and their we, strengths. Right, and we don't use it as a hiring tool. We use it after we hire them. Oh, okay. It's more of a development tool. Right. So it's like, you know, Joe, tell me the challenges you're having right now in your day-to-day, -day, and nine times out of 10, you're doing things right now that aren't in your in your strengths. So we would get your strengths and help coach you into using those to achieve what you want to achieve. So mm -hmm. that's how we use it in development. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's pretty powerful. And you can do it with children. They can take the assessment as early as nine. Mm. And then um, I even did it with my 86 year old mom because she decided she wanted to go back to college. Wow, cool. And when she was 80, she said, I'm going to go and get my degree because I never got my degree. And she got it in film, screenwriting. And so I said, well, let me take your assessment and see where you're lying. Well, of course, she had high learner, high input, which she loves to gather information. And she had high responsibility. So she got her degree this summer, the oldest one to graduate from college at SMU oh. handout. So you're never too old or too young to get your assessment and to find your skills. Um, and it just opens new pathways. And I've seen the, the lives change in it. And it keeps people engaged at work. And then what we do for team building, we actually get everybody's strengths and we do team discovery. And they see there's four different domains that your strengths are in. It's either executing, strategic thinking, influencing, or relationship building. And I was coaching a team, for example, uh, Monday. They had high relationship, high executing. I said, you before we even started, I, said, I want y'all to all go get your food and, and take a minute to relationship build because they can't move forward. And that gave them energy, right? Because I knew they were high relationship building. But then one of the things that they are great at is executing. But one of the pitfalls or one of the hindrances of that is they're not they don't take time to celebrate. Yeah. Because they just go boom, boom, boom from one event to the next event. And they don't. And so it was, that was one of their action items is to take time after even weekly to do wins, small wins of the week or something. Is that something so, that you suggest or that they learn in the process that they should um, get on doing? As a, as a coach, we talk, I ask them, what do you think is, what do you think are the benefit? We call it a balcony and a basement. What do you think are the balconies of the fact that y'all are high relationship, high executing? What do you think are the basements? You know, basement is a hindrance. Oh. And then I guide them to figure out what it is they need to do. And nine times out of 10, they're looking at a team grid of everybody on their team and all their different strengths. And then all of a sudden, it's like you've got an x-ray of the team. It's like, oh my gosh, we've got an important project. Like when we were going through COVID, when I was at Southwest, we knew three weeks before the, everything shut down that something was happening. So we had to get a group together and I got put them on a team grid. Like, goodness gracious, we've got three people here with futuristic. We've got somebody high and analytical and we've got a deliberative. We're going to lean on that deliberative to help us poke through things that we need to think about. So all of a sudden those people feel valued because there might be the only person on the team that has that talent. And then the team learns, oh, we're going to lean on you, Joe, because you have this. We need you to help us do this. And it gives that Joe person, you know, an energy to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and energy and also like to be in charge or something important for the whole team, like to, to be able to contribute, not only in the individual level, but actually, yeah, for the team mm -hmm. win, the win of the whole. Absolutely. Mm. And people, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're in a team, you're usually probably working alongside other people, whether you're clients or your partners. And so being able to figure out, I work, I have a lot, I'm an entrepreneur now. So I have to, I pull in different partnerships for different projects. And the first thing I do is a team grid. Oh, how are we showing up as a team? What do we need to, how can we help each other? You don't have to be just in a corporate environment to do that. Yeah. You can do it in family, you can do it a lot of different ways.
So this, so this is clearly something for um, research group leaders to look into, uh, also for postdocs as they prepare to, you know, maybe apply for a leadership position and then build their own team, but also established yeah. ones to reassess and to appreciate what they have in their team and yeah. learn what what skills and assets each of the team member brings. And then would you would you say that because um, PhD students or postdocs within a research group often are lonely soldiers, even though they are part of a group. Mm -hmm. um, so if the initiative, if, if a PhD student listens to us and finds us interesting, looks into the, um, the tool, which we will link to in the show notes um, or um, the blog post, um, and then, so how how can a team member who's not in a leadership position bring this? Have you basically have you seen this happening or coming from bottom up into the group? Kind of the group? that's the way it usually happens. It's usually oh, grassroots, okay. unless a leader like I have a founder that reached out to me at the end of December, and we did it with his team, and he was one that had heard about it and wanted to do it. So it comes from different ways. It, with our case, it was just within our department. It was just, you know, somebody bringing it in saying they had done it. Let's try it. And so most of the time it takes grassroots and, but you always want to try to find a leader that endorses it, that becomes the sponsor of it because then it can help grow it. Yeah. But for us, it took three years to grow it outside of our department yeah. into the company, but we were, we, our engagement numbers were increasing because everything we do is based on, we get all the research data from Gallup. So we knew that our engagement scores were improving. We knew that our people were feeling more valued at work and nine times out of 10, and we focused on the leaders. It's all about the leader. If the leader is not engaged and not engaging the employees, the employees not. And, you know, that's why I say it's that there's a book that Gallup came out with called It's the Leader. And it really is. And so I spend most of my time working with the leaders, but I do have individuals that come and say, I just need help. And so I'll do some coaching with them as well. But the leaders are the difference makers for getting this across the department. Yeah. For the okay. Yeah. For the wider impact where I can see it already a uh, boost in self-esteem also on the individual level. Like Absolutely. Even we, we, we know from Gallup, when you know your strengths, you are uh, three times more productive at work when you know and live them. And um, you're six times more engaged because you, you're just living in your strength. You're living in that powerhouse. The problem is if somebody gets their strengths and they don't have anybody to go over it with them mm -hmm. and they don't study it, they don't know how to apply it, right? And so that's why coaches come in. We say everybody needs a coach. So the coaches come in and just help listen to them and listen to their strengths, listen to their goals and help guide them as they go through the process. Yeah. And also identifying the resources they might turn to. At the oh, yeah, there's, or, yeah. And if you go to gallup.com right now, there's a ton of resources for Clifton Strengths. Like today, yeah. they even came out with the mental health issue and how as a leader, what are the things you can do to help boost mental health in your workplace? Mm. And I think that's, you know, we know that's a big problem because, in, you know, they just came out with that data this morning. And I think it said 40%, what do they say? Um, Gallup research has revealed 40% of U.S. workers report having reported their job has had a negative impact on their, uh, in the previous six months. So that's why we're going into this kind of mental health challenge right now. And that's why it's important for people to know their strengths and know what they can use and make sure they're able to connect with their leader. Yeah. Or if they're, if they're like us, both you and I are independent, right? So we've got to have some accountability partners. We've got to have people around us that we can talk to. Yeah, it's a so. the situation and to you know, put it into perspective other than our own. The, the mental health topic is also growing and or yeah it's a huge topic also in academia because of the publication pressure and the, some kind of a toxic environment i try to stay away from from uh judgmental terms like that but it, it, it is quite a lot of pressure in academia and 
there there's a clear need for reform and reform is on the way so i'm saying this um yeah and i think it's basically um on on the systematic level there is a search and um and a fostering of the strengths of what's what's going well instead of we i mean we can also I mean, it's not going to happen but the alternative would be to dismantle everything like kill academia as we know it and build something new and better but this would come at a huge cost so it's probably not going to happen <laughs> um, and instead yeah also for an institution to look what's actually going well what are the systems and the infrastructures that we want to keep and what are the like how can we tweak it but now okay so for mental health so it's it's one thing that uh uh, a working environment or a team culture that that is not as supportive as it could be or not as appreciative of the of the achievements made by the team and individual within um can have its toll on on the mental health of the the team members and that's that's measurable and that's really sad in academia i think it's like it's significantly higher um the numbers differ but it's like up to 60 percent higher as compared to other um industries or sectors where and it's probably also within the corporate world there you know it also differs here and there but i don't know if, like oh, statistics you never know who who runs them and, and what they write to. but um but while then also from interviews people complain it's not a health environment to work in um oftentimes so um okay so what give and take so how much influence do we have as individuals by i mean there is a clear influence that we have so basically if we can do or i'm trying to rephrase so by taking charge and appreciating and learning about our strengths and focusing on these we can have an actual positive impact of our on our own mental health and well-being in the workplace right. which will also have its positive effects on the personal life and again also vice versa so but uh, do you have an example of how this then looks like? Because I think it's mm -hmm. true also for many corporate jobs, but in academia, especially like a PhD student or postdoc or researcher, generally speaking, is expected to do most of the things by themselves and personally. So there's not much that you can delegate to another department, really. So you have to run the experiments, you have to write the papers, you need writing skills, you need to understand the publishing workflow, you need to do some administrative work, grant writing. So there's a lot of, and I think in like not so much in small companies, but in medium size and bigger companies, you have departments who are specialists in, in some of these aspects. You can just delegate it out um, or outsource um, somewhere else. But, but as we analyze our strengths, how can we then tweak our everyday work life in a way to really foster the strengths and let go or manage the weaknesses in a way that they don't hinder us? That's such a good question. And I am on a quest for this. When I was working with different teams and organizations, and I've worked with a lot of founders and individuals, it's it goes back to you've got to transform yourself first from the inside out. Um, and then be aware and know what you're made of, like know your, know your strengths, know what you're made of and be able to stop and analyze. I tell people when you know your strengths, you're able to turn them up and turn them down. So it's like different thoughts will come in about a situation. So mm -hmm. I'm going to take it into two different ways. So you mentioned the independent uh, researcher that doesn't have anybody to delegate to and they're doing a lot of different roles and um, oh seemingly so often the like this is what I meant also earlier with resources often the resources are there at the institute in the team even there are technicians there are the people who could lend a hand here and there and could take over a task that we, either we are not good at or we need to delegate because we need to take holidays or attend a funeral like which yeah some, um like life happens or a wedding <laughs> like something more sure. so so the yeah. reason is, is, is also in a, i think it's also taking charge of the opportunities and realizing first of all what what am i good at what am i not so good at and then are there either people in the team at the institution or 
outside the institution that I can delegate this to, like pay somebody to do this kind of work. Is there, does the budget allow this? Am I ready to pay this from my personal budget? I mean, I wouldn't recommend that to happen, but it's in reality, sometimes a year that's that's the case. And that's then again, like calls for a system change that the budget needs to be available for certain tasks that are simply too much for a human being to, to um, yeah, take charge on yeah, here's, themselves. Yeah, I hear you. Um... The bottom line is we're not supposed to be well-rounded as individuals. We can't be. We're so yeah. unique. And so the goal is as a team, we're well-rounded. Mm-hmm. So as you mentioned, it's you might not have all the resources at hand, but you have a list of your 34 strengths and you know the top five you never leave home without. Your six through 10 is usually your back engine room. There might be some tools in there that you can use in your strengths, that you can combine some of the strengths to make things happen when you have to do them on your own. Mm -hmm. But I think if you are a high achiever, which is common, we know from Gallup that achievers number was, is in the top five of what we see across the world and people that have taken their strengths. So achievers like to get a list, check things off and make things happen. And, and if they have high responsibility, which is also high across the world is a, is a strength. Um, people with high responsibility don't know how to say no, and they don't know mm. how to just take a break sometimes. So they have to tell themselves, Ooh, I've got high achiever, high responsibility. Let me turn up my empathy. If they had empathy, I'd say, why don't you turn that one up and put that empathy on yourself and think about how you're going to plan this day based on outcomes and what strengths are you going to use to get the things done that you need to get done today? And so I saw this need. When I was coaching at work and with myself and with individuals. And so I went to Gallup and I said, have you created anything to help people live in their strengths daily? And they said, no, we really don't have anything. And I said, well, good, I'm going to create it. (laughs) So I did. And it's called um, the strengths journal. And it basically um, is you plan your day based on your strengths. And if there's something I need to get done, like I am not good at the administrative. I'm not good at some of the, I don't enjoy doing that. It's not one of my talents. So I brought in a virtual assistant to help me, or I'll find, I'll, I'll figure out how to use my resources to point them in the area so that I can spend my day using my gifts and my talents and dominate the day and be more transformed than if I just kept trying to do them and push, push, push every day. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I think it's also a matter of personal responsibility to allow ourselves breaks. Right. And to realize that we need breaks to re-energize, to keep going. And putting those breaks in your schedule. Um, putting, like, if, if and I, that's why in the, in the Strength Journal, I have you work on what are the, what is the outcome I want for today and why? And then what are the three big things I've got to accomplish today? And what strength am I going to use to accomplish them? And then by the end of the day, you kind of review it and think about, well, what are you grateful for? Because that gives us energy. And then what at the, and then also what is one fear or one thing I learned today? Because when we're walking in fear, we're learning, we're growing. We're not growing unless we step out into some kind of fear. Um, And we want to be learning every day. And then halfway through, through the end of the week, um, I have everybody grade their well-being. To your point, um, the well-being uh, is so important right now. And when we're, when we're good and mental health is good, the, the organization is good. And we know from Gallup, there's five areas that they studied all worldwide. What are the five areas that people need to have to have a good well-being? And it's career. You like what you do every day social you have meaningful friendships in your life so there's that social piece financial you manage your money well physical you have energy to get things done in other words what you're putting in your body and how you're working out your body throughout the week and then community you like where you live well coming out of covid people were threes and twos if they were rating this one to five every every single one of these so i have you rate those every week Mm. and it helps you figure out oh my gosh I haven't spent any time with my friends this week. I'm going to put that in my schedule next week. Mm. Or, oh my gosh, I really need to spend a you know, couple of hours focus on my financial. Or for me, my physical had gone down and I had to get a, I had to get a plan together for that. And so 
oh. I kind of combine physical and social. So I have a friend I run walk with and that's my social, my physical, I do every Friday. And then I work out with my husband twice a week. Okay. So, um, it's just figuring out where you're low and assessing yourself constantly uh-huh. and not because either we're running our day or we're, des- we're letting, we're designing our day or we're living our day by default. Mm. And when you live by default, you don't feel like you've got anything done. You, know, you don't feel like you feel like you're doing what everybody else wants you to do. And that was me. And so I said, I got, I got to change this. You're, you're hitting weak spots also on me. Like I think out of those five, I'm neglecting three, if not four. So okay. it's like, I think we're all on and off sometimes, but it, as you say, like we need to constantly assess or have checkpoints every once in a while and hopefully not too far apart from each other. Like maybe once a month have a check-in with ourselves put it in the calendar yeah. like am I really feeding mm-hmm. all five of these corners of my life um, and you know I've been doing this for almost three years and I can tell you there's never one week where I'm all fours or all fives I mean there's always something that needs some attention but, but over the year it, you have, the, have them all covered yeah but doing it weekly it really helps me know what I've got to do the next week to get it back up otherwise okay. then we get into mental health issues Right, as I said, monthly, I already realized well, maybe weekly would have been better. So let's let's settle on weekly uh, like check-ins with ourselves to mm-hmm. to make sure we we cover all five categories. Right. Yeah. And it's so helpful, even with people you work with, if they're having a rough day and you can just say, How you know, how's it going? What do you think? And you can say, How's your you know, are you liking what you do every day? You know, are you getting to meet your friends? How's your financial? How's your physical? Something in there will pop. And they'll go, oh my gosh, I haven't spent any time with my family or my friends in two or three weeks. I need to schedule that. Mm-hmm. You know, something will pop. Um, and it comes, I was doing a session with a, a big group in healthcare a couple of weeks ago. And somebody mentioned that they're, they don't feel safe where they live. Well, that's community. I said, well, what are you doing about it? Well, I haven't really thought about it. So right then and there, we got some of her coworkers to help her find a new place to live. Um, mm-hmm. But she didn't know how to ask that. She didn't know what it was. Mm. until we did this does that you make know, sense maybe she didn't have the energy to to address that issue or maybe wasn't aware that it's even so much of an issue that it actually hampers her and, and um, influences her work efficiency yeah absolutely absolutely so by her doing that self-assessment just three minutes it takes um she was like oh my goodness this is what's causing my pain i didn't know what it was yeah mm. so it really helps so it's it's a combination of using all of those um, but then saying, okay, if her social or if her community wasn't good and she didn't know what to do and she's high woo, which is winning others over with one of her talents, then she needs to get an environment where she's going to be around other people in a positive way. Mm-hmm. And so we apply the talents to that to help achieve that. What is your experience of people reporting to you how, how much passion and purpose is important in their work life? Like, I mean, what I'm what I'm observing amongst researcher colleagues is as soon as kids are in the in the picture, and also friends who are not in academia, priorities change, and I think that's okay. Like because yeah. now we have another human being to make sure it's okay. Mm-hmm. So the the monetary aspects become more important than the like what you're actually working in and usually it's still within the realms of what you actually enjoy doing but I feel like as much as I'm very much purpose and passion driven and want to you know improve things for researchers currently um, contribute to an improve global equity situation with yeah with what what I do so I, I have also high standards for myself and what I want to achieve in my career. But, and then again, like researchers usually like oftentimes start with that, but, but isn't it also fair to find a job where you feel, okay, even if I'm not the driving force, but at least I can contribute to something meaningful. Mm-hmm. And how much does, like how much do people who you work with um, say that's important to them? Oh. Yeah. So is the question um knowing your vet, knowing your purpose and 
how important that is, whether think, it's your next Yeah, I think this is, it goes in all kinds of direction, but I think it also comes with a self-assessment, like what am I actually here for? What is important to me? How can I have a direct uh, contribution to like, to the, you know, to provide benefits for society or my community through the work and how I make a living in this world or yeah. in, in the city or in the workplace? Um, because often we hear like, oh yeah, I have a job to to earn some money or to, to to sustain my livelihood, and then I have hobbies and I do community work for the purpose. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but would you? Because I like, wouldn't it be an ideal world where the workplace can provide for both, like the money? Absolutely, and absolutely. Um, what I start with is strengths. Let's get your strengths, and let's understand what each of those you know, how you're wired. Mm -hmm. Then we get, the, what are your core values? Most people don't know their core values. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. so usually when you write down and I don't want you picking more than five, what are you, you can go Google core values, go pick five. And then all of a sudden you look at your core values and you look at your strengths and they start mitten matching. They start matching mm -hmm. and you're like, oh my gosh. Oh, so you. I have maximizer, but one of my core values is excellence. Well, maximizer is a, is a strengths talent, and it means taking things from good to great. Excellence means always tr striving for excellence. And quality. So those mid and match. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The next thing I do is have people define their mission. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing this with individual contributors, managers, all different levels in the workplace, as well as entrepreneurs. Because I don't think if you know your why, you can't get through the tough, the valleys of life. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't matter what role you have or what title you have. What matters is that you know your purpose. Mm -hmm. Because you're bringing your, this is the marketing piece of me coming in. Um, you're bringing your leadership brand with you wherever you go. Mm -hmm. And if you don't define that brand, somebody else is going to define it for you. And why not start with your strengths, your core values, then your mission, and then we develop the goals and we reverse engineer their goals based on where they want to be by the time they're 90. What's the legacy you want to leave? So it's yeah. all about meaningful work, but it's, it, it will apply. So when I worked at, at Southwest, I loved it because it was about giving people the freedom to fly. And I was able to do that. And I was able to help brand a company where we gave people opportunity to travel and go do and see things they have never could do before because it was so expensive to fly. Mm -hmm. And so it tied into my, I didn't know that at the time, but it was my personal mission to help people be their best, right? So it all tied in mm -hmm. and I didn't know. It. And it probably for you and your audience too, it's probably all tying in what you're doing. You just haven't put it all together. Yeah. And I think, it's also like, why do you choose a certain research topic to to apply for a PhD position in the first place? Is it because your parents were lawyers, so of course you pursue a law degree. Or um, my mom was a medical researcher for some time, um, but for me it was always she didn't push me. She just wanted to make sure I have the opportunity and the motivation to go to university, and then make my own choices. And I. I think I was inspired by her, but I always knew medicine is not for me. I was more interested in, in biology and nature and animals. So um, I, I never really even considered medicine as my career path, even though my grandmother was also a medical researcher. Anyways, um, so that's interesting. So is it because that's your upbringing and how you're being imprinted as a child and, and growing up? Or is it your free choice? And often with with re or with university topics and disciplines, um, you know, for the bachelor and master's programs, like I also didn't know what I get myself into that I had to study so much math and physics and chemistry to, to study biology. Like, well, and that's also Smart where girl. there's a high dropout rate, and then people realize, oh, actually, that's not what I signed up for. So let me. And then they identify other interests where they have more dedication to pull through university. Um, but then at the research level or in the workplace, like I think the strength finder approach and the 
no, or realizing what your values are also helps to realign with the corporate or the institutional or the research project values and, and mission, um, which can be to, well, it's in academia, it's primarily to acquire, acquire knowledge or to, yeah, so, that's so, it's, it's late, so. No, and <laughs> I'm I- I'm sorry with my English, but yeah, so. Uh, no, you're doing, you are amazing. Well, and I think we we fall into careers one or two ways because somebody told us we we're going to be good at something when we we're going to be a doctor. My husband, his grandmother told him he's going to be a doctor. He's going to be a doctor. And we met in college. He came to me as I don't want to be a doctor. You don't have to be a doctor. Be who you want to be. Hmm. And he he changed even though he got his degree in you know in in um, biology and all that. He ended up going into the real estate business and loves it. Hmm. Um, but that wasn't his thing. But he was told all his life that was what because his dad was a doctor. So I think sometimes we're, and that's why I love working with kids and spotting kids too. Usually when I'm working with leaders, I'm talking about their families and their, their spouse and their kids and, you know, help your kids identify what they're, what they enjoy doing and what makes them, gives them energy. Um, because we're going to have, you know, 12 to 15 careers throughout our life. And as I said, talent stacking. So it's t- stacking. Who knew that I was going to create this coaching? This wasn't even on my radar 20 years ago but it became my career because I saw a passion there and I saw the opportunity so I think that's it's just finding that and living that and if you can't do it daily in your job then finding ways to do it as a side hustle or other things so you can test it yeah I think that's also important to leave as a message because I was taught and I thought once you choose a certain path in academia like for me it was molecular biology you cannot switch anymore because you will not have the track record to continue and be accepted as an expert in the field right that's not true i've i've seen not many but there's quite a few researchers who actually change topic sometimes completely or they shifted from one um yeah topic within a discipline to another and that's totally doable because it literally takes less than a year to do the literature research and research i mean give or take but it doesn't take more than a year to catch up with what's the state of the art what's the relevant background information what's the history of the discipline or the research what's what's known in the field since whenever relevant or considered relevant at a time um yeah and the freedom to also like once with a I, I've said it before in another episode where maybe um it, it cannot be stressed enough like there's not enough position in academia to for all the PhD students that we now have and, and will have in the future to all land a job in academia. That's just not enough positions. So it's less than 10%. Some say three to five percent of the PhDs will stay within academia and um pursue tenure track towards professorship. And with it, staying within a academia of this three to five, uh, four percent, um, that includes everything in the academic corpus, like from administration to project management to so only a handful will be a professor because there's only so few positions really. Um, but that's not bad news because there's so many interesting jobs outside academia. And, mm-hmm. and I think this is again where maybe we can spend another five to 10 minutes like to change sector, be yeah. it from nonprofit to corporate or in our case from academia to whichever other sector, because um, there's a thing called transferable skills and the strengths that we have um, in, like endogenously, so like in, intuitively as personalities, plus the skills that we require on the job. And in academia, we don't usually get certificates for the skills that we require. So the transferable skills analysis, is that something you're also dealing with? But the message is that whatever you're working on in a sector or in, a, in whatever you're keeping yourself busy with to, to as a profession, um, analyzing the skill set, hard skills, soft skills, the strengths, um, that's applicable wherever. So Absolutely, yeah. And you can develop, you know, you can design your career. I mean, you could be a researcher, writer. You could be a, I mean, I worked with a ton of researchers in marketing. 
Um, you could be, there's just all kinds of ways that research can be woven into your key strength areas mm -hmm. and develop that and be, just create, you know, what that's going to look like. I would create two or three different pathways and then you might have a hybrid of two, you know, I wouldn't just do one, here's my goals and here's, I'm going to be a professor. That's, as you said, there's not that many of them, but why not create a unique path for yourself based on your talent stack and where your gifts are? Mm. And, you know, and you can do things on the side while you're still doing that research thing to test yeah. out, is this the career for me? Is this yeah. what I want to do? It's basically also what I did. Like I'm very values oriented. I have high values and, and expectations to fulfill these for myself. I've downplayed my expectations onto others because I think it was just too much to, for other people in my vicinity to handle and wasn't fair of me to apply my own value system onto others because each has a very for their settings a very valid value system and like we shouldn't be judgmental I was like oh why don't you care as much as I do about whatever is important to me like that's not not a good approach and I had to learn the hard way <laughs> well, and you, when you remember that you're one in 34 million, not everybody's going to have look at life the way you look at it. You know? yeah, and that's and okay. So, it took me some time to yeah. accept that and yeah. to also to accept was one step and then the other step to appreciate that because that's how we also continue to learn from others and by engaging with other people. Um, and then like to not only to look at what we choose as a profession and a topic to spend our work life at, but also what's otherwise important to us, like human rights, environmental rights, animal rights, like all these things were, you know, or still are important to me. And I feel like to some degree, I've created a job for myself as a solo entrepreneur, but, um, but I, I can live all these values because I defined a position for myself and I managed to have an income with it. So that's possible. And that's what's exciting because you figured out your why and you're living it. Yeah, I think the why was always clear. I just wasn't sure if there's uh, somebody would pay for that. <laughs> but you know, yeah. they do because that's the uniqueness that they buy. That's your brand. Your it's the brand and it's also like it had for me i had to build the systems to make it viable sort of thing like to create a website to to define services and packages that are yeah that that others could then appreciate and see the value in for themselves as well so yeah you made it happen Mm -hmm. which is amazing and that's that's something we can all learn so i had to learn quite a few new things like marketing now also recently mm -hmm. <laughs> um so we can do this as we see others do it or we can actually study it to some extent and do it the right way <laughs> and be more efficient with it yeah and there's no right way for marketing there's no right way you know yeah or it's, like it's using your it's using your it's figuring out what your talents are and how you're going to use them to make it happen I think what I mean with the right way is just not, it's about putting ourselves out there and again to, yeah. to present the products and the services that are um, available. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you cool. should be proud of yourself. You know, I think that's hard because you're innovating new things and, and you don't see it out there to compare. It's like, well, I don't know about this, but just keep going because, you know, that becomes <laughs> that your unique brand. And that's, that's what amazing. makes that talent stack so special it's also constantly evolving because the market just keeps evolving and changing and that's also a good thing i think it's just about staying flexible and go going with the flow swimming against the stream sometimes to also define and sharpen unique swelling points to to use the business lingo but and it's the same for research like there's research projects who have it easy to get funded or researchers who have an easier way to find funding for their research projects they're interested in and then there is always these niche topics or i mean research that always struggles for funding because there does not seem to be enough interest for or benefits for society or corporate interest for applicability um, for product development so so in that sense 
And this is also, I think, a growing thing for academics and research projects to realize how much marketing is also necessary within academia and within, it's, it's just that it's not usually called as such, but marketing as in, you know, defining what are we, why are we doing this? What is it good for? Um, and, and the answer of to acquire knowledge in a certain space is not enough. It should have, I don't think it should have ever been enough of an of a reason to do research just because we can, or we need to learn, but why? What's the what's the real reason? Why do we have to be able to fly to the moon? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and wouldn't it be better invested to fix our attitude to treat this planet first to make sure we have several more generations to live here and then we can explore the galaxies. <laughs> Anyways, yeah it's pretty exciting when you see and you start applying it every day and then you start applying it to yourself and going okay I might be the only one thinking this but maybe that's what I'm here to do I'm that saying this good. at the same time NASA um, is doing a great job in also changing the paradigms and how research is being done and also um, the whole galaxy and and um, space research also helps us acknowledge how fragile the system Earth is and how much we're in charge of it. And yeah, also the opportunities we have to, again, ensure. So so there's, um, yeah, just to... And if that's your passion, yeah, it's sharing yeah. that. Sharing that, how, how can you share that with people? And it's using your talent to do that. Mm -hmm. it's, important, it's important message to get out there yeah and i think the question is like we know we have limited resources as in money and how can we best spend the money to do research or to to pay uh staff in whichever sector and workplace to do the work that a company or an organization has signed up for doing to serve society and yeah it's about at the end of the day it's about efficiency but also well-being for everyone to keep everyone healthy and happy. <laughs> we had another episode about being a happy person. And that's also something that, yeah, let's be happy people as we do work and appreciate our strengths and acknowledge and appreciate each other. Yeah, and you're happy when you're doing what you were made to do. You know, that gives you energy because you'll mm. push through all the challenges because you're doing something that is really powerful for you yeah right and, and so that's when you know you're in that talent you're in that strength mm. and yeah I, I, I would like maybe i don't know if this is a call to action to whenever you're listening to this um as you're listening but like what it would be interesting to hear also from others like what, what makes you happy about your research and um or is there something you would want to change did you realize from this conversation or maybe you realized before and now it's um kind of supported by by dana's um explanations about the strengths finding mission and and embracing your values that oh actually i'm more interested in something else and now i have a better idea of how to phrase it so yeah also yeah. to say like we're both of us i i think we're happy to hear from you and how can yeah. we get how can people get in touch with you? Yeah. So I am on LinkedIn at Dana Williams Co. I'm also, they can re email me at Dana at Dana Williams Co.com. And I'm also, um, you can go to my website. It's Dana Williams Co.com. Mm -hmm. And I have a 15 minute um, just discovery call. You just click the button and set up some time and we can talk to you what you want to achieve. And, and I can get you on the road to that. Cool. So, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So yeah, nice. so let's, thanks for today. Thanks for this. Thank you, Joe. Thank, thank you so much for having me. And I know it's late there. So thank oh. you for staying up. <laughs> we spent so, an hour. It's 6.30. So, so your dinner hour. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, speak soon. And thank you. Mm -hmm.